All right, uh, antitrust policy notice, please uh, review the information there. Um, moving into the agenda, a couple topics, uh, just quick FYI on Hackfest planning, uh, then we will finalize the discussion for the work group's proposal. Uh, Hyperledger composer request to uh, go 1.0, and then after that, the quarterly project updates and the quarterly work group updates. Um, so the first thing, just a quick reminder, uh, is next Hackfest, June 27th to 29th in Amsterdam, registration information is in the uh, agenda and all the minutes. And then last week we decided uh, October 3rd and 4th we would have the hack, the other Hackfest uh, piggybacked on to Hyperledger Member Summit in Montreal. So that'll be October 3rd and 4th. Uh, that's all there. Uh, with that, uh, Brian or Tracy, did you want to kick off continuing the work group proposal discussion? Well, um, I, I think we're converging pretty much to something that matches the um, uh, uh, the discussion last week and kind of where we ended off. Tracy sent an update. Um, you know, without quorum, I guess we're not really ready to, to vote to accept it. Um, uh, but uh, maybe just see if there's, you know, five minutes worth of any last comments or questions, you know, so that we can tee this up either for a vote next week or maybe even one over, over uh, uh, email. Um, any, any other thoughts from those who had a chance to read Tracy's message or look at the document today? Yeah, so I actually looked at it. I think it's fine. Works for me. Yeah, and uh, I think uh, the email voting is a good idea. Okay. Um, so, so uh, uh, sorry, I'll, I'll let anybody else speak. Okay, well then Todd, maybe what we do is tee up a vote over email for this and maybe for a uh, composer too, um, or any other, um, it looks like that's the only other vote that we would have taken this week. Um, uh, so if it turns out that we're ready to vote on composer, we can combine them into to one vote. But um, at the very least, let's, let's tee up a vote over email for this. Um, following the call. All right, sounds good. Yeah. Was there a question from someone else there? Yeah, sorry, how, how short of quorum are we? This is Dan. Uh, we're missing two still, unless, uh, I know Ben and Chris are out, so unless Greg, Hart, or Nathan have joined. And it sounds like no, and doesn't look like it in the attendee list either. All right, uh, so with that, then we'll, we'll get the email vote teed up. Um, otherwise, onward to Hyperledger Composer to continue the discussion. So Simon, Caroline, or uh, anyone else from the Composer team. Hi, it's Simon here. Um, I wasn't on the call last week. I was off on vacation, um, but I believe there might have been some technical questions from last week that needed answering. Uh, Nate just joined, by the way. Got it. Thank you. Hey, <clears throat> hey there. I think, uh, um, hey, Simon, uh, if I recall the conversation from last week, I think there were a couple of concerns about um, uh, where about licensing um, as well as about a security scan. And I think the third was a question from Dan um, um, about uh, kind of, you, you know, where, where the project is in terms of um, looking forward to a future of being portable to other DLTs. Um, is that, do I recall the right three outstanding issues from last week? Um, th that would be an interesting discussion on, on other DLTs. I think I was just trying to understand the feature completeness as far as urgency to go to a 1.0 and then actually subsequent to that I, I had spoken to uh, a couple other uh, people who had um, expressed some concern that that when we created when we're looking at, at what the rules were for whether a project should be active or not seemed like maybe the general consensus was that in most cases a project should be active, but there's some corner cases where we might want to allow for um, small projects 
that would not have uh, ever have the opportunity for significant diversity uh, to become uh, to to be able to do a major yeah yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah and so uh, I think that for for some of us uh, it seems like composer is a very popular project that has a lot of uh, resources behind it and so the uh, kind of the direction that that I was going was that it would be nice if composer could take some time to continue to develop that community and fulfill all of the uh, active prerequisites and then come back for for 1.0 approval from the TSC Okay, your thought is it might not meet one of those edge cases where uh, we'd approve a 1.0 before graduation from the incubator. Right, and I'm not sure if, if everybody's on who, uh, from, from the TSC, who had uh, had some of these, some of these initial ideas about what, what that criteria meant and, and why we would allow for, for certain edge mm -hmm. cases, so. Uh, I won't be able to speak for, for the people that aren't here, but uh, that was definitely the, in thinking about this a little bit further, in what cases would we want to facilitate a project going to make a, a production release announcement when, um, sorry, conflicting call coming in here. So in, in what cases would we facilitate a project to do a major release when it was not yet considered active under the, the open source governance rules that we'd set up? Sure. Um, the other thought that I had here is it looks like Composer is just very, very close to being able to be active. Um, you, I mean, they have maintainers from two organizations um, and they have a significant installed user base that uh, a lot of folks are depending on. They seem to have really good support at the different hack fests um, in terms of people coming to learn and use their software. And so uh, if, we, if they do a 1.0 without going active, it seems like um, that might take some of the pressure off. Um, where they're so close to be able to go active, it might be uh, a really good thing for, for the project to, to get that uh, status at the same time. Were there new folks who were concerned about um, Composer not being able to reach uh, or graduate from the incubator? Anyone on the TSC? Uh, well, the Composer project is um, very popular in the community, and uh, um, currently there is no hard requirement that uh, when the project go to one dot release, um, how to be integrated and work together with other projects. But uh, I would think it uh, will be a better thing if uh, Composer can um, focus more on to be integration with other Hibernator projects, like uh, um, besides the fabric, like the Sawtooth and uh, Cello and uh, also other projects. There are uh, great opportunities to work together actually. Just, just a quick note that we are at Quorum now. Okay. Yeah, I have something to say. Actually. It's not really not really a concern, but just to say, it's not clear to me. So, what happened with the last? So, we use Composer a lot, but we don't use it like in production, right? We use it to prototype. Uh, we use it as a actually a development tool, right? We show somebody how the network is going to look like once they have a I don't know the business logic, right? The, the the chain code kind of deployed, right? So we don't have to spend a lot of time on kind of it's clear what's the assets, what are the participants, and kind of what is the model. So we use it for development, right? But what happened is that the last version of Composer really broke a lot of the previous API. So we had to change a lot of things with 0, 16, 19, like just the latest cut. So I don't know. I don't know if we have any restrictions uh, or enforcement of any API stability with 1.0. I remember we committed to that in, in Fabric 1.0, like when we released it and before that, 
when we did the release candidate and I said, I don't want to release the release candidate before we lock the API and everybody says that they're okay, that the API is not going to change. Are we going to enforce something like that or we want to keep it free even though it's a one zero? It's not a concern, it's just a question. Yeah, so really you speak to impose a team right. and to lock the API too early, right? So, Yeah, I, I can answer that. So um, we have been following semantic versioning rules. Um, we've been bumping up the middle number every time we make a breaking API change. Now, yep. there were a lot of breaking IP, API changes between 16 and, and 19, and a lot yeah. of that is due to the rework we did um, to pick up no, J, mm -hmm. the JavaScript chain code support in yeah. uh, Fabric 1.1. Um, and a lot of those changes were also required for us to be production ready to move from that POC stage, which, as you say, we've been mostly used for so far and um, but now now we've got the native node.js execution we feel that composer projects can be used in production no no but the, the, would you, you feel that the api now is more stable are you happy oh. to commit to that or you want to keep it open still so when when you vote i, I don't want to force you into this you know but if you if you say that you may still have more changes i just don't want you to to be obliged to keep this api that's what i'm trying to say right yeah. we committed in fabric one zero but it didn't come automatically. We didn't inherit it from the one zero status, right? Yeah, no, I'm, I am happy that um, if we move to 1.0, the API would be stable. Okay, okay. Because that's another argument, right? For going one zero, maybe. For, for, for people that are concerned. Okay. You know, I'm, I'm not on the TSC, but uh, my personal take would be that, um, uh, you know, the composer team seems ready for 1.0 and we should evaluate whether this release is ready for 1.0. And if we feel the graduation is imminent or, or that it's close to, to being offered, we could vote separately on that pretty soon. Um, I, I, you know, I, it's cleanest, obviously, if uh, uh, 1.0s go out from, from graduated projects, but um, I feel a sense of, uh, you know, momentum behind this that that would be nice to to to, to recognize and, and move forward on. But uh, uh, unless there is a strong reason not to. Um, and I like the questions about API stability and what more we can do to grow the the user community and and the deployment profiles of it. But uh, but I think we should just think about what are the criteria for a 1.0 release, um, uh, and and does it does it meet those criteria? This is, I think, our first time we've considered, you know, approving a 1.0 release since changing the policy. So it's natural that we feel our way through this, but yeah. I wouldn't, I wouldn't say changing the policy. We didn't have one before, but. Uh, <laughs> that's, a, that's, a, that's a change, that's a delta. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Zero okay. to, from zero to one, as, as Peter Steele said. Yeah. So, so I, you know, from my point of view, I, I listen. I listened to Dan and I'm a bit surprised by the way car you characterize the, uh, you know, this possibility of releasing 1.0 because I don't think we use terms like, oh, for small projects or anything like this when we're talking about this. For me, it was really a matter of, okay, we're separating the, the maturity of the community, which is, you know, labeled with those uh, terms of, uh, you know, a status, uh, whether you're in incubation or, or uh, active project with regard to the operation of the project, you know, the test, all this stuff we've talked about from the quality of the product, the software they're developing. And so the release, the number, the one zero release for me really should be mostly um, or primarily, you know, uh, uh, focusing on the, the, the quality of the, the software and uh, whether it's stable enough, whether it, you know, it, it fulfills a set of requirements that seems reasonable that has been set by the community as a goal. And, you know, and as such, it, it makes sense to have a one zero release. I think Jonathan's question on the API is right on. That's the kind of things we should consider. Uh, yeah. But so, I, I would really prefer if we kept those two things separated and, you know, we, I, I think I, I was the one who said, in a way we would be like penalizing them twice if we said you can't have a one zero release because you didn't reach the community criteria of, I think, you know, broad participation to be active. 
So I think it's cleaner to separate those two. And uh, you know, now speaking from an IBM point of view, I can tell you the uh, the pressure internally to move to active is not going to lessen because they re the composer team really is a one zero version. I can guarantee you that. Yeah, I think there was probably a couple different views on what what was important out of the the active process in that would relate to a production release and what that would mean from a, a hyperledger perspective versus say a company perspective and definitely one of one of the viewpoints that that had arisen in that conversation was uh not wanting to double double penalize uh, a project and and one aspect of that is uh one aspect of that that had been raised was whether the size of the project was something that would never really arise to have a, a large population or a diverse population of maintainers and so it would be stuck in a in a catch-22 something that it could never really resolve and so I'm a little bit, one of the things that, that's coming to mind for me is, all right, so this is the first project to, to come forward after we've, we've established, try to establish some policy about what is the, the community aspect behind a 1.0 release. And so if the very first project we get is a project that is already a you know, well-resourced project from, from a large company, um, that has popularity that's closely associated with an already popular project, it seems like it's at a really good place to be able to develop community. And it seems like the case then that we should give that project the time to develop that community, which probably shouldn't take much longer, and then be in a position that when it does release, it's not in that condition that, um, that, that these community policies are meant to, uh, to help guard against, that you've got a, you know, a single vendor kind of situation. How do uh, and other members of the TSC feel? Do they feel like <clears throat> I, I, they would be they that this is, that's the question is open enough to be um, that it's not worth a vote today, um, or it's worth a vote but doubling down on on graduating composer from incubator to avoid and 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 perhaps <laughs> applying this going forward uh, to uh, um, uh, future projects that are likely to hit a 1.0 before their graduation. Uh, or, or do we want to serialize this and require graduation for composer first, um, uh, because of for the reasons Dan mentioned? I, I guess uh, maybe I have one question for for Simon. Um, you know, I, I don't I want to be the only one speaking, but so you know, it's funny because when I, I I'm asking Ar myself Arno, those Arno. two. Yeah. Wait, uh, I think Kelly was speaking. Sorry. Yeah. Sorry, I just had a question um, just around, you know, what do you see as the, the barrier, uh, I guess, to getting that community? Because it does seem like Composer is one of, if not the most downloaded Hyperledger project, at least from, you know, Docker uh, Hub statistics. Um, so I'm just kind of curious if, if there are barriers there that maybe the TSC could help resolve or, or if there are community activities that we should be driving more uh, to inspire that sort of contribution. Um, so, as you say, we've got plenty of users um, and we've got very active Rocket Chat channels around people using Composer. What we don't have is people coming to the Composer team and saying, hey, I'd like to work on this or, hey, I'd like to think about working on this feature or I'm just looking for something to contribute to Composer. Could you help us find, uh, help me find something? What we are getting is doc fixes um, and, and little bits um, that are, are just popping up. And to the side, but no one's really coming and interacting with us to start looking at big pieces of feature work, I guess. Um, and I don't know why that is. Um, as far as I can see, um, we're not doing anything wrong on the community front. Um, we're being quite open with our plans um, through GitHub. 
we have weekly community calls um, and those are scheduled at two different times to cater for different time zones um, but those are poorly attended um, yeah I, I, I don't know what else we could do um, I'd welcome any uh, concrete suggestions about what we could do to open up to a wider range of contributors So I can tell you just a little bit, just because you asked like so candidly, right? I think I think we are all operating in a very weird environment. You know, it's like this enterprise space is new to me. Even though I worked for big conglomerates before and stuff, but running a business in this space is kind of strange. So we've done a lot of work for some big organization, and we really wanted to contribute it back. They didn't want it. They said, "Look, we paid for it. It's ours. You just like we just support it for them, right? If they have some bugs, but they don't want to contribute it back." which is a shame for us because we could get the visibility, we could make Composer better, et cetera, et cetera. So now they have a version of Composer that is better. And to be honest, in 019, it stopped working for them because they couldn't get the latest cut from you and they asked us to do more work for them. So it's kind of, I don't understand this mentality yet. So when you're asking me why people are not going to be back, honestly, I don't understand it. I think most organizations in enterprise are still not fully aligned with a business revenue or business model that is still utilizing and making the most out of the open source environment. So they, they, this, it's strange for me too, I'm telling you, Simon, just, just, just to share. But I don't understand why people don't contribute to, especially not to a development tool, right? Yeah, you can show because, uh, tools that are more graphical do uh, present a greater barrier to bringing people into the core contributor status. I mean, you see this with the Mozilla browser, uh, Firefox mm -hmm. web browser on the Mozilla project where the project would not have succeeded as a, as a distributed multi-vendor open source project. It needed to pay a thousand developers full time from <laughs> the Mozilla corporation, right? Um, so it's a, it's a, there is a bigger hurdle there. And I think, um, you know, there's probably perhaps more we can be doing at the Linux Foundation to, to help people cross that chasm. Um, I don't know. Um, I just, I worry a bit that we're conflating these two questions about growing the community versus approving a 1.0. And I think we, again, I'm not on, I'm not the TSC. I'm trying to just play Chris's role here to shepherd us forward through the agenda. <laughs> um, but I, I, I think in general, we should be careful when we create new rules, uh, uh, new requirements on the project that we be clear about when and how we approve the, you know, subjective questions like this, you know, uh, are, you know, the more bureaucracy we add to the process, the harder it might be for a project to feel like this is a great environment. So I feel like we should try to be as narrow as possible in this question. Is Composer ready for 1.0 or not? Um, and I, I, I respect this is our first time pondering this question <laughs> um, uh, and, and we need to feel our way through, but we should try to find a template, a repeatable kind of criteria by which when we get the next submission and the next submission, it's much clearer for those teams what are the criteria they have to hit either to release a 1.0 before graduation or, or after since we're also requiring it of projects that have hit graduation to get their 1.0 approved. So, so I, I agree with what Brian just said. Again, I think we should focus on the very question of whether the software qualifies as what we would consider necessary for a one zero release. I'm a bit concerned with what Jonathan said, not so much about the community aspect, although this is a concern in of itself, but you know, does that mean, you know, the composer as it is, is not fulfilling requirements from some people out there and they should maybe be taken care of before Composer team declares victory one zero release. But it's, it's we've got to separate that from whether it's active or not. Otherwise, we are getting back into the discussion we had before as to whether we want to entertain having one zero release in incubation at all. Yeah, just the fact that they didn't want to surface the requirements to everybody. You know, someone is saying, what am I doing wrong? I don't think they're doing anything wrong. So I'm with you, Arnold, totally, and Simon and Brian, I, I agree. It's not like the guys are asking always, how can we help? What can we do to improve? And, and people don't raise any hands and, and not, not asking for more stuff. And then they do stuff. Yeah, I don't think it's, it's you know, what, what can we do? I think the decision to go to 1.0 should be based on code maturity and the ability of the project to support issues 
you know, think of it from a business perspective. You know, when your company releases a 1.0 product, you know, it's able to handle support of it. It's able, you know, the, the codes reach a certain maturity, in our case, past certain security scans, things like that. And is it, you know, is the project able to support things? Is documentation available? All of that. Well, we've got, we've got some other um, agenda items for this week. So again, just playing my process hat, do we want to vote on this, even if the vote isn't, isn't unanimous um, or likely to be unanimous this week? Um, or do we want to take some other action offline and come back next week? I think it'd be useful to have a vote to see where people stand. Not everybody has been speaking up, so. I actually would rather wait for Chris. Okay. But that's my view. But I don't. It is one vote. We we don't. Yeah, we don't need to vote for whether we should vote. <laughs> <laughs> oh, too bad. <laughs> what are our rules for voting? <laughs> uh, if if quorum if quorum is hit, you can have a vote. Um, uh, yeah, sorry. Uh, Chris had uh, indicated previously his yeah. support for um, approval for this. So Brian, one of the things I was trying to ferret out here, not to belabor this, was in in earlier discussions about the importance of the the community aspect. I had understood maybe a little different interpretation from from what it sounded like I was just hearing. Um, and so, if you could just describe a little bit more your thoughts on the the. Uh, the, the community breadth behind a project and that's relationship with 1.0, I think I would find that helpful. You're asking me or are you asking Simon specifically about Composer? I, I'm asking you specifically. About the criteria for when a project graduates from the incubator? Well, about the, the relationship between that and, and 1.0, because I maybe interpreted yeah. some things in, in the past to being more the there was, well, but, there should so, be a, a heavier weight on, on community breath. Yeah, so uh, um, I, I actually would, if I were on the TSC, I would not have voted for the, the rule that had the TSC approve a 1.0 release, whether it was in incubation or active, partly to try to separate these issues out. Um, I might have required it to graduate from the incubator first um, uh, before being allowed to issue a 1.0 release at their discretion um, uh, because uh, uh, I do think it's important for uh, uh, you know the health of the community to be formally recognized by the TSC for this to be yeah, you know this is a viable thing this is not two people uh, or one one person's you know kind of fantasy project this is something that uh, it, you know, this is a an effort that has more than one company involved, has more than two developers involved, um, and you know, should be a signal to the world that you know they've they've they're using the tools in the right way, and this is worth people's time and attention. And to some degree, we might expect that a lot of people don't um, want to climb that con contributor curve or that learning curve until they see that signal that the project has hit that graduation status, you know, that it's kind of got the training wheels off or whatever. Um, uh, and so just like we saw with Sawtooth and with Fabric, hitting 1.0 is also a time when um, more people come into the project, they start using it and by sheer, you know, uh, virtue of numbers start, um, you know, getting into the covers and, 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 and contributing. Uh, so I, um, you know, I, 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 I accept the idea of being able to release the 1.0 before uh, hitting a, a graduation, um, uh, that's fine with me. Uh, I just, I, I go back to if we are going to institute rules and, and processes, we need to be as objective as possible in our implementation of them. Otherwise, it's going to be a very frustrating experience for projects coming through, um, uh, coming through the, the, the hoops that we put, put them through. So I agree with that, and I think the practical way to look at it is to look at the list of executoria for the uh, for the uh, active status. And I thought, you know, we pretty much agreed that 
maybe somebody could release a 1.0 version if they they met if they meet all the criteria except for the community breadth. And it's you know I haven't checked to, to see if the they map one by one, but I thought that in Simon's email he pretty much tried to address those points. Simon, tell me if I'm wrong there, but. Yeah, so I, I believe we've met all of the requirements for active status apart from the community. We are cleaning up some license stuff at the moment with Tracy. Um, we've requested the security audit and I think that's going to be kicked off in May. Um, so uh, the points that aren't complete are, are certainly in hand. <coughs> yeah, in, in fact, we kind of left that to the side in the conversation. Um, <clears throat> but uh, uh, on the license uh, status stuff. Um, is there anything that's going to require? Because typically, for for previous projects, um, even when it's been something completely you know benign, like bringing in MIT license code, we've still required a approval from the governing board. Actually, just because the stuff that comes in under MIT still has a, a tiny bit of patent risk to it, um, stuff under other licenses, you know, et cetera. So typically, for both Sawtooth and for Fabric, we have required. A, a legal review and then and then a approval by the governing board. Uh, I know the lad, ladder ladder step hasn't been done. So are we? Um, is this something that would hold up approval for 1.0 anyways? Is kind of my question. Uh, on on the legal front, from what I've seen, most of it is just files without license headers. Um, so we're uh, we're adding in automation to add the license headers in. Um, I think there are a couple of files with the wrong license that we pulled into um, for testing rather than actually part of the code. Um, and, and we need to do something about those, whether it's just remove them um, and use our own test files or um, seek approval. Um, but uh, from a timeline point of view, I wouldn't have thought we'd be able to go 1.0 until we had the security audit done. Is that correct? Yes, yes, that's correct. Mm -hmm. So, so uh, we're looking and this is very close to, yeah, but yeah. We're going to be looking at end of May-ish at the earliest then, I would guess. Okay. Well, does it make sense then to, to actually defer this vote till um, that point? I mean, I, 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 but I thought we were like voting on what would be an imminent release. You know, we'd vote and then proof a tarball would show up <laughs> and, and, and you'd all begin working on 1.1, right? Um, I, or are we approving here something that still would, would be end of May before it would be released as a t and tagged as, as 1.0? I was under the impression we needed the approval to get the approval for the security audit, which we need to go. For the budget. Yeah, yeah, yes. Yeah. That's correct. That's right. That's how oh. it came up. Yeah, Dave, Dave so, wrote that up, right? He said, "Do we want to spend money on something that's not, uh, you know, going to one zero? So, yeah, <laughs> this is how we started, like more than a month ago, right? We said, yes. "Do we want to allocate the resources?" And then we said, "Okay, let's take a closer look," and then we spent some time. And yeah. so, please tell me we are moving forward because I just signed the paperwork <laughs> on the security <laughs> audit. <laughs> <laughs> okay, yeah, that, and, that, and that was news to me too. I mean, we do presume that, I mean, we, we've, we've done this with Aroha, for example, uh, and, you know, any other project out there that, that signals to us as Hyperledger staff that they are ready, you know, or that a 1.0 release is on the horizon, you know, we, we uh, start the process anyways. Um, so uh, I didn't realize the TSA had discussed uh, adding that step in the process as well to, to turn on the security scan. So. You know, we're doing well, it. yeah, it's happening. I, I was doing it for comedic effect. Um, this is good if we delay it a little bit because we do want to do it before 1.0. So, sorry, I didn't mean to cut you off there, Brian. It just And there are about 100 files that will need to go through the legal committee and the governing board as well for approval for licensing. So wearing my Chris hat, um, I can, you know, I mean, not, not that I'm, uh, you know, official TC chair or whatever, but I, for this call, but I think I'm carrying that. Um, I, I kind of feel like we can, we can defer this vote um, and come back closer to those steps in the process being done. And in the meantime, let's, let's as, a, as a TSC, think offline about ways that we can help bring more developers into the Composer community. Um, 
and and see if we can get some closure on some of those issues just to or maybe even look at graduation from the incubator in the meantime um, to, to address address those concerns. Uh, but uh, but it seems like this train is moving forward with Composer 1.0 to, 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 to do the security scan, to do the, the license request. Um, and, uh, uh, and we can come back for final approval of the 1.0 release sometime in May. Does that make sense? That makes sense to me. Yeah, same here. I wanted to defer in the first place. Yes, sounds yeah. good. Yeah, I agree. Okay, and can we clarify that projects don't need approval from the TSB before starting the security scan or the license review, whenever they go to a 1.0 or are in the process of moving towards a 1.0 release? Yeah, I mean, I think I should... let it tell you with that, of course. Yeah, we, we were given a task, but yeah, sure, sure, of course. If, if you guys are happy with that, then we, we, we'll, we'll follow that. Mm -hmm. We can definitely be more aggressive with security scanning in 1.0s. Yeah, I have no objection to that. I think it's good to get the scans done earlier than later. More chance to mm -hmm. fix things. It's mainly just about trying to uh, have a, uh, you know, the, the right number of rules, you know, uh, and, and the right number of steps in this process. So, so just trying to... Um, yeah, avoid adding one more, one more step, one more approval. No, also in a way, you know, we can look at the security audit report as, as also some form of evaluating the, the quality of the code and the maturity, right? So it may not be a bad thing. We don't want to be like too trigger happy on the budget, but in, in some cases it makes sense to, to have more, more eyes looking at the code, right? Yeah, oh, for sure. I definitely agree with Jonathan. Okay. And I do like the fact that there's signaling to the TSC that a 1.0 release is on the horizon too. So that's great for us to know collectively and, and that sort of thing. Okay. Should we move on to, um, actually, if we still have quorum, do we want to revisit uh, the approval for the uh, um, working group template? Yeah, I think we should do that quick. Yep. Uh, <clears throat> so going back to that, it sounded like uh, from those on the call, there were no concerns, no objections. Um, so just stopping for a quick second to make sure that's still the case. I'm definitely in favor of it. it looks good. All right. Uh, so quick vote. All in favor of the TSC, please say aye. 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 Any abstaining? Any opposed? All right. That passes unanimously. Great. So I'll the remaining on the wiki then. Great. Thanks, and Tracy. And just, so, a com so, just a compliment to Brian and Tracy for pulling all this together. It's been a little bit of work, but the result looks really good. Thanks, Nick. So in the remaining um, 16 minutes, uh, we have two, two more, two reports to consider. So why don't we dive in, just dive into the first, uh, which would be, um, sorry, I, I lost my slide here. Oh, Satu. Um, so I, I can definitely go, but I do know that we have had, um, uh, Mark on the, the docket for the last few weeks for the, uh, the performance working group update. So it might be fair to let him go first. Okay. Mark, would you like to go? Sure. Thanks, Dan. <clears throat> so, um, performance and scale working group, I've shared the link here, and I, I won't read it. I'll, I'll go through it real quick. Um, our main task has been working on a metrics document, um, which sounds easy till you get in and try to define things like what a transaction is and across multiple blockchain implementations or DLT implementations. Um, so it's been a great learning experience for me and I, I think for others. Um, for as far as health, the, there's a core group of about eight to 12 regular participants. Um, we're spread across the globe and many different companies. Um, three or four, two or three people at least from academia as well who are um, participating members. And uh, there's some info on them down at the very bottom in the additional info section if people are curious. Um, let's see here. Um, you know, we've reached out across several other groups outside of Hyperledger um, and they've read our preliminary stuff and, and the feedback is it looks basically like what theirs does. 
Um, so we're also looking to collaborate with other groups wherever we can. I think that was one of the, not directives, but one of the wishes of the TSC when we formed the group was that this isn't just a hyperledger thing. This is, you know, ideally going to work across the industry to see where we can get help. And we'll get to that a little bit more. Um, <clears throat> when we felt the time was right, we've been working with the Caliper project um, and they've been, you know, very active in our work and it's been good to have them because they can go off and implement, you know, what we were saying and give some examples based on their working experience. Um, but, you know, Caliper was recently approved by the TSC and uh, so, you know, we have something that can start testing some of this now right away. As far as issues, there's no major issues at this time. Um, I think like most of the other working groups that I've heard, you know, the progress tends to be slower than desired on getting the documentation written or the documents written. Um, I will note that, you know, I've been involved with SPEC and, and this process is actually much quicker than what I've been involved with the SPEC on uh, SPECvert and SPEC Cloud. Um, one thought I didn't know, um, I know personally I, I hate writing English. Um, or any non-computer language. And I didn't know, I know we have some documentation groups. I didn't know if it would make sense to see if there's people in the documentation teams that might want to help work on some of these documents across the different working groups. Um, just a thought out there. Um, the other thing that has just come up recently and uh, you know, the possibility of using a large test bed to um, test some scale of the blockchains. And basically the working group feels that it's not really our job to go off and be the test arm. Um, you know, if, if the TSC would like to give guidance that it is, then, you know, we can adjust our views accordingly. Um, but rather, you know, we should be involved in helping to, in, in test definition, um, auditing, et cetera. You know, and, and definitely feedback from the TSC would be appreciated here. Um, and long term, um, you know, I think if we can cooperate with SPEC or TPC or organizations like that, um, that would be great as well. So I don't know if there's any discussion people want to have on that right now. Uh, Mark, Mark, this is Brian. I'll throw in. Uh, so from time to time, we do find ourselves either with offers of spare hardware um, for test purposes or with access to test infrastructure and uh, on our side at Hyperledger staff, uh, we are will try to organize those re the availability of those resources and access to it. We might even be able to find some budget to be able to pay for some instances for 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 testing and that sort of thing. But uh, um, we it would definitely benefit us to have uh, some community process uh, where there's some some way of kind of figuring out uh, how do we apportion those test resources and how do we standardize. Um, you know, and, and uh, you know, when a project shows up and says, hey, we'd like to have access to some infrastructure, be able to test some things, how do we make sure that that's optimized, right? So if there's anything we can do to help with that, uh, or anything that, you know, anybody in the community we could work with on that. I don't know if it means the, the this working group or some other group, but uh, it'd be nice to channel that through something community. Um. Okay, yeah, let me take that back to uh, the working group and uh... We'll, we'll discuss it there. Um, so overall activity in the past quarter, the mailing lists and chat channels tend to be very uh, not active. Um, we tend to work outside the meetings and then discuss the work during our calls. Um, at the end of last year, I, we moved to weekly calls to help speed up the process um, because the biweekly calls, you know, you'd say, oh, I can, uh, personally, I would say, oh, I can get to that next week and have a week to work on it before the next meeting. And then it would turn out I wouldn't get to it the following week either. But with weekly meetings, it, it tends to get done quicker. So um, after this, we're going to start um, on more workload definitions and guidance as, as far as running tests, things like that. The longer range, um, th this can become a DLT selection guide for different use cases. Um, the goal here being to list, you know, what we think the key attributes and measurements are for different use cases, figure out how to use this with Caliper to work with the consumers to make smarter choices on DLT selection. Um, and I know I talked with uh, one of the guys from um, the Ethereum Alliance and their performance team hasn't started up yet, but I shared with him where, where we are. And uh, so we might actually, you know, get to work closely with them as well. 
as I mentioned before, you know, it's a very active, diverse group of people. Um, you know, we have a couple regulars um, from academia as well, and their infos and the additional information, I, I don't need to go through that now, but if people want to see that. Um, one of the interesting things is Amari is, uh, I think in America, we'd call it a teaching assistant, um, or he's an assistant lecturer. And he has 200 plus students that he, he talks about blockchain. So there might be um, some people there, you know, out of that pool that we could get to work with some of these areas, um, Hyperledger in general. Any questions? Okay, well, thank you. Oh, go ahead. I have a quick one, uh, although I, I understand if you don't know the answer to that, but do you have a time frame in mind as to when you might have a document that you think would be worth publishing? Um, I am hoping to have it done within the next two months. I don't know, that might be aggressive based on how it's going, but at this point we're looking at adding use cases. You know, we have the majority of the definitions there and there's a link to the metrics document if people want to see it but we're looking at you know some of the finishing touches I, I would view it as you know more definition on use case and workload and adding pictures things like that all right thank you I don't know if other people on the call from the working group have their thoughts that care or share as well okay well thank you for your time Oh, okay. No questions. Uh, then, uh, um, Dan, do you want to uh, walk us through SAW2? Sure. Um, I, I, was, I was muted there at the end by accident. I, I don't know that I would quite say we're at, at the finishing touches point on that document, but I, I would hope that we're uh, going to be basically done with it within the next month or two, uh, like, like Mark was already saying. Um, so let me grab the, the note for the Sawtooth update and copy that into chat unless somebody has already done that. Uh, there we go. Um, so uh, I will be brief since we're running low on time here. The long and short of it is that Sawtooth continues to be healthy. We're very uh, active on all fronts. Uh, the mail list as usual is, is kind of uh, substantially quieter compared to most of the other things, which are our chat and uh, GitHub and stuff like that. So uh, there's no big changes there. Uh, we have introduced, though, from a communications aspect, uh, we've got a, a couple standing meetings now. So we've got, uh, I think it's on Mondays and Fridays, but I put in the link for the, the Hyperledger calendar. We've got something that, that we sometimes call office hours or uh, the application development forum. And that seems to be a, it's something that we've just started recently, but it seems to be like it'll be a very well attended thing for people who are trying to spin up distributed applications on Sawtooth and, and have questions about uh, things that they're getting hung up on. I think it will become a place for discussing things that are becoming best practices. So that's a, that's a new thing that, that uh, most people are probably not aware of because it's only started within the last week or two. Um, we have released 1.0, I suppose that's burying the headline, but uh, that's, that's kind of old news, but I think that happened after the last project update. So technically that's news for this project update, the 1.0 is out, but actually within the last week, we already released our first uh, point release there for 102 that's got uh, actually quite a bit of bug fixes and improvements based on the, the feedback from uh, from the first looks at, at 1.0. And then we are on track for, or we're in the midst of planning what the 1.1 entails. And we're looking at sometime mid-summer for 1.1. And the, the two features that come to mind for me uh, and, and other maintainers may have uh, bias towards other features. But the two things that, that I'm most focused on are uh, we're doing a lot of performance work. Getting, getting Sawtooth into 1.0 shape was, was getting a lot of the, the bones in place, getting that API solid that, that people could rely on. 
And now that we've got that in place, we want to we want to remove things that are hidden behind those interfaces that were in Python, for example, and, and replace them with more performant languages. Uh, and then the second thing that is, is close to mind for me is the consensus interface. So there again, we're not going to be breaking things from uh, a user's perspective, but what we want to do is provide even more flexibility on consensus algorithms. Right now, what you can do with, with Sawtooth is change the consensus on the fly with a running blockchain. And we've got a handful of, of algorithms there, but what we wanna do is be able to expand that much broader to allow uh, not just companies, but also academic uh, researchers the ability to, to try out new consensus protocols that might have, uh, that might have benefits in, in one niche or another. And so that, uh, that new consensus interface is being uh, designed and developed now, and, and I would look forward to that being released as part of the 1.1. Uh, from a diversity perspective, um, probably some, some increase there. Uh, we've got one of the things that's going to start to make this a little bit more complex to track is that we are, as, as the team is growing, as the community is growing, it's too hard to have everything in a single repo and we'd already kind of expanded out of that before 1.0, but I see that's not, not, not continuing to expand uh, as far as number of repos, but we've definitely exploded that a bit in, in, uh, in recent months here. So those are, wherever there's, there's things that are, are well uh, I don't know, encapsulated together that makes sense to be in a separate repository. Uh, we're going to start doing our maintainership more by by that component maintainer uh, rather than a kind of a single collective. And that is the five minute version of that update, leaving us with a couple of minutes for questions. Thanks, Dan. I have a quick question. I know that Poet relies on specialized hardware. What do people actually use? Do they use the hardware? Do you? They not. They don't really care because they're in production and they use simulation. What, what do they do? Do you know? Uh, so a lot of people use the simulator version. So when we when we released Poet, we wanted to make sure that there wasn't a, a vendor dependency on that. Right. So the very first way we released Poet does not require uh, any specific hardware trusted execution environment. And so that just runs as a simulated enclave. Uh, it does so without the full Byzantine protections. Um, and I, I guess I don't know off the top of my head what the breakdown is of people that, that do go for the full Byzantine protections and then use, uh, use SGX in a production and deployment versus people that are satisfied with what's either weak BFT or strong CFT uh, for Poet Simulator. And there hasn't been any sign of anybody contributing or working on porting it to different hardware? Uh, no, I have not seen that yet. If anyone knows of blockchain teams at ARM or AMD or otherwise, um, uh, I'd be happy to reach out to them or I just don't know. I haven't heard of anybody at, at those companies. And uh, as far as I know that uh, Microsoft is doing some uh, software based uh, uh, trusted environment. Yeah, that's right. They have something called a VSM, I think, that is a, a software based uh, trusted execution. By the way, nice progress to Sawtooth. Thank you. Okay, well, I will take uh, Chris's hat from Brian and say that it uh, sounds like there's no more questions and we're at the end of job, as Chris would say. So, mm -hmm. so well. good to me. Well, thank you, everyone. All right, thanks, thank everyone. You. Thank you. Take care. Bye. Bye, guys. Bye-bye.